Good morning. Welcome to our Palm service, our Palm Sunday service this morning. Um, all of you out there are watching us on live video, we hope that we're, we're a blessing to you today. Our pastor is actually out of town, so he's not here, which accounts for like five people in the sanctuary today. <laughs> so, <laughs> when he's away, man. Anyway, I just want to open up this morning in prayer. Let us, let us, uh, let us just kind of invite him into the service this morning. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being here. God, I thank you, Lord, for this, this day you've given us, Lord, to worship you, Lord. I thank you, God, for what this, this season means to each and every one of us, Lord, starting with, with today, with this being Palm Sunday and ending on Easter Sunday. I pray that God, you just bless hearts and souls and lives. I pray that God, something we do say or sing this morning, Lord, will touch somebody, Lord, we'll lead them to you and to your cross. Ask God in Jesus' name. Amen. Just kill Morning, everyone.
Fine here. Can't turn my phone while live, it says. It's upside down. It's fine before. Say something, Kelly. <laughs> well, we might be sideways, so we may go upside down. But the Lord is still here. Right. It's not and changing at all. If you have a prayer request, you can put it on the Facebook page, whether we're upside down or sideways. <laughs> Somebody will be here. We'll Why is it not? stand on our head. Um, but yes, if, there, if you have a prayer request, put it on the page. Uh, See? Linda, we miss you. We'll be praying for you. Probably making people dizzy. <laughs> I miss your high high voice this morning.
live on Facebook, we apologize um, for the sideways shoved you had and the, and the topsy-turvy you had. Um, technical difficulties when the pastor's not here, he's used to using his phone and everything, and, and for some reason I just haven't got the knack of using my phone yet, I don't know how to do this. Um, you hate to put something live, but you're not doing anything that, you know, looks bad. But um, I do apologize for that. But you know what? It doesn't matter, because God is here. God is here for worship, for us to worship. God is here for us to praise. God is for, here for us to just give him praise and glory and honor and, and all those things. Because, you know, it doesn't matter if we're sideways or right side up or if it's upside down or um, if the music's great or if the music's messed up or if we miss a note or something here and there or if I, I miss something. If God is in it, he'll make something out of it. Amen. 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 So every time I get up here, I get really kind of nervous because I don't do it often enough. And things like that doesn't help me much when it goes sideways like that. I'm sitting here kind of half embarrassed and half like, oh, should we just go home? Just we'll call for me and go home? But you know what? That's not what God wants this morning. God wants us to worship him. God wants us to get into the word. Because it's by the word that we live. It's by the word that we grow. Amen? It was nice to see that uh, we've had a few more people show up since uh, we first opened up this morning. Uh, I was kind of worried that the only person we had here was uh, Sister Dykes. <laughs> My wife wasn't even here yet. I said, okay, where is everybody at? But it's nice to see the sanctuary filling up. So today is Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday, I, I never really thought a whole lot about Palm Sunday until I started, started studying um, in his word for this. I actually had a different message prepared for today originally. And then I realized it's Palm Sunday. I said, Pastor, what do you want me to do? Do I have to do Palm Sunday service or do I do can I pray can I preach what I was preach what I was planning on preaching before? And he said, You can do whatever you want, Bill. Just mention it's Palm Sunday. But as I got into, into the word and got into prayer, God just really impressed me to preach about Palm Sunday this morning, so that's what I'm gonna do. Just stand uh, I'm gonna be reading out of Matthew. Um, verse uh, chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. It's kind of long, so if you can't stand, don't worry about it. But if you can't stand, stand with me for the reading of God's Word. Matthew 21, 1 through 11. And I'm reading out of the New King James, King James Version. It says, Now when they drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethpeg the, the, at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. All this was done that might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and is sitting on a donkey, a colt and a 
follow the donkey. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them, and he sat upon them. And a very great multitude spread, through, spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road also. Then the multitudes who were before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had come to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? So the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet from, Seth, from Nazareth of Galilee. And I'm sorry I'm talking kind of fast, so I need to slow down. We'll get through it. Amen. Let us pray. Father in heaven, I thank you, Lord, for the privilege and the opportunity of being in your house. I thank you, God, that, that you've chosen me this day, Lord, to, to bring forth this word. I pray that God, you just anoint me, Lord, to, to bring forth the words that you want me to bring. I pray, pray that God, you'll touch those that are in our sanctuary today, Lord, and those that are watching on Facebook, that God, you'll just touch and bless them, Lord. Let something I say touch a heart and a life. Father, we want to be changed by your word. We want to be, be uplifted by your word. We give you all the praise and honor and glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen. May you see. Palm Sunday marks the beginning of what we call Passion Week. It starts with Jesus coming into Jerusalem, honored, revered, then his arrest and his crucifixion. People would turn on him. One of his disciples would betray him. His disciples would deny knowing him. But after all this, one short, after all this, can't read up here. After all this, in one short week, he would be raised from the dead. The contrast between Sunday and Friday, and then again the following Sunday, is quite remarkable in the word. First three verses of my text set up what was about to happen. Jesus is instructing his disciples to go and get him a donkey to ride into Jerusalem. So it's interesting to me that 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 all it took to borrow this donkey was for the disciples to go to this man and say, hey, you know, we're going we're, we're gonna to take the donkey. You know, somebody would come to me and say, hey, Bill, uh, give me your car. I want to drive your car around the block or something. Like, um, I don't know. Do you have insurance? Do you have anything else? But when it comes to this, you know that since this person just let the disciples take the donkey, you know it was God. God was in the middle of all this. The next part of the scripture talks about the prophecy that is being fulfilled. When you study the word and see all the prophecies about Jesus, you wonder how they all missed it. How did all the people around miss it? Think about even going back to Christmas and the birth of Christ. How did people miss the signs and the wonders and the great things that God was doing? How did people miss the fact that Jesus was going around now in his, in his ministry and healing the sick? How do people miss all that and not realize that he was the son of God? It's the same today. People can look around and see and hear about God. His prophecies. His glorious handiwork in this world. His miracles even today. And people still reject him. This is springtime. I love springtime. I always have the opportunity to talk about springtime. No longer do I have crocuses in my yard, so you won't hear about them much. But I look around, all things just start to bloom, start to come up out of the ground, all, all this new life. All of a sudden, the grass that a few weeks ago was brown, now it's green, getting lush. You look in the skies, and there's a, a person on my Facebook page from Hobart that keeps taking these awesome pictures of the sky over, over Lake George. And, and you look at that, and you wonder how can people look at that and not see God's handiwork in it. How are people so deceived that they think, ah, oh, it just happens. It doesn't just happen. It's God. But for this brief moment in time, the people seem to get it. They praised him. They put down palm branches and even their clothes down on the road before him. They shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. However, in just a few short days, this will change. Prophecy that is quoted in this account is found in Zechariah. They were shouting hosannas, which means God saves, and hallelujahs, hallelujahs, which means Yahweh, praise Yahweh. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. 
Zechariah 9 9 says, Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See your king come to you righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. See your king comes to you righteous and victorious. For this brief moment in time, that's what the people were seeing. They're seeing Jesus coming in on this donkey. Lowly, humble, but yet righteous. Problem is, the people were looking for an earthly king. You know, when I think about all the history of the Israel nation, they were always looking for a king. God didn't set them up to have kings, but they cried out to God saying, We want a king, we want a king, so God let them have kings. They're always looking for a king, they were always looking for a ruler, they were always looking for somebody. To come and, and save them from this, this world as far as the things that happen in this world. But the kingdom of God is actually the kingdom of heaven. They were looking for one who would deliver them from the Roman tyranny and rule. This is how it is today. People are looking for salvation, deliverance through leaders, programs, running here and there, following anything, anybody that promises money and or power. It is interesting that this is the only time in all the Gospels that Jesus elevates himself above the crowd. But instead of doing, doing so by mounting a war horse, he gets on a donkey and rides into town, indicating, among other things, that he comes in peace, not with a sword in hand. That's what him riding on the donkey meant. See, he was coming in peace. Jesus comes quite self consciously. As a prince of peace, not as a man of war. But here's the irony, the crowd didn't get it. Today, so many people don't get it. But in the background of all this jubilation, however, there were religious rulers who were plotting his demise. I was reminded of, of Paul after, after um, the disciples, after Jesus was resurrected, the disciples went around healing people and, and preaching Jesus. And the Sadducees and the Pharisees brought, brought them into the courts. And Peter says in, in Acts 4, 8 through 12, says, Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said to them, to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame, and see being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you built was rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no other name, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. I like that when Peter rebuked them and says, 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 this is the stone that you rejected. He didn't say that the builder rejected us. This is the stone that you rejected. Meaning that this is the, you, you, you turned your back on Christ, and he was actually the Messiah you guys were looking for. Do you guys not understand? You study the word, you not understand it? He was the Messiah you were looking for. But he's become the great cornerstone. Salvation is found as no one else, not in relationships, not a pastor, not a teacher, not a political, political figure but only in the name of Jesus Christ. Anybody out there today? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I know, I get kind of carried away sometimes. <sighs> My cousin in Alabama, Larry Will, I did a, a, a Palm Sunday service called Tears of Jesus. I thought he had some really interesting points. He points out in the Gospel of Luke, Concerning this day. Luke 19, 44 says, As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground 
you and your children within your walls. They will not leave one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. I never really thought about Jesus stopping in the middle of this procession and weeping over Jerusalem. Did you know that? It was kind of, kind of a, I don't know, I read the scripture and read the scripture and read the scripture, but it never really hit me until, until I, I read notes from Larry's, on, from Larry's sermon. If, if you, even you, had only known this day what would bring you peace, but now it is in your eyes. Right. How many times do we go through our lives seeing things around us, thinking they'll bring us peace, and, and it doesn't bring us peace? The more money you make, the more money you spend, does it bring you peace? No. That nice new fancy new car you buy, does it bring you peace? Eh, for maybe a minute or two while you show it off, but after that it kind of starts to rust and get dented, right, Carol? I dented Carol's car this stuff this winter. So once you have the shiny new car and all the new ones wears off, where's the peace at? Get a nice pretty new house and man, you're working, working, decorated, and invite your friends over to see it, and pretty soon you go, gee, I want to redecorate again. You know, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a never-ending battle, battle where we're looking for peace in all kinds of crazy things, in all kinds of things. But we need to look for peace in Jesus Christ. Amen. We need to look towards him for that peace because he's the only one that can give us that peace. One of Larry's points is had they, they had eyes, but they did not see. They had ears, but they did not hear. Israel had missed the whole point of the message that God had sent them. How many times, folks, do we miss the point that God sends us? We've seen so many things around the sanctuary. We've seen God bless. We've seen people dance in spirit. We've seen people lay out in spirit. I've seen kids from youth groups, man, just all over the floor, just laying out under the power of God. We've seen God heal people. We've seen God touch people's lives. We've seen people get saved at these altars. Man, we just need to remember those times and get that message. And get that message out to other people that Jesus saves. That Jesus is our Redeemer. That Jesus is the Waymaker. That Jesus is the one that can heal us. That Jesus is the one that can heal our land. We look at a lot of crazy things these days. We look at our country, and our country is so split, so divided. And I don't care what side you're on, whether you're on this side or that side, we're so divided because we don't want to listen to the other side. We're so divided because we don't rely on him to bring us that peace. We're looking for this person to bring us peace, or this person to bring us peace, or this person. We're looking for all these people all around us to bring us peace. But only Jesus can bring us peace. It's like I said earlier in my message, if people only knew. Today, if people would only open their minds and their spiritual eyes, they would see the coming of the Lord so close. The prophecies in this word are not just for sweet stories I talk about. The prophecies in this word the ones that have already been fulfilled are to show us that this word is true. Amen? And the prophecies that have not yet appeared, are, that have not happened yet, are to point us towards that coming day. Towards that coming time when we see King Jesus split the eastern skies. For that time when we see our loved ones that have gone on before. That's what these prophecies in this book are point us to. And if we fail as a church to open our own eyes and then fail as a church to open up the eyes of those around us, we fail Jesus. You know, I failed this morning when I had my camera up here and we we're sideways. That was a big failure. A couple times I missed a couple of Kelly's uh, Kelly's uh, Kelly's signals. <laughs> That's the word. I'm getting old, you know. 
And so, so sometimes the music wasn't quite as good as it, it is when pastors are kind of, I just miss some of the signals. But those things are irrelevant. Yeah, I'm embarrassed. Yeah, I can sit there at the piano when I hit a wrong note or, or something doesn't go right. I sit up there and just kick myself all over the place and just, you know, come on, Bill, get it together. But those things are totally irrelevant. What is relevant is Jesus Christ is coming soon. And we need to prepare ourselves. We need to prepare those around us. Palm Sunday was a good message to do that, preparing the way for Jesus Christ to come in. But again, they were looking for an earthly king. Matthew 24, 38 says, For it is, for as it is in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark. How many times have we done that in our own lives? Haven't thought about Jesus. Thought, ah, oh, well, it's going to happen, it's going to happen, it's going to happen. Of course, the older you get, I've discovered, the more you want to be raptured and not just die. <laughs> but when I first got saved, man, in the, in the 70s, that was the thing. Wow, the Lord's coming. The Lord's coming. The Lord's going to come. got to get yourself ready. got to keep yourself ready. you got to keep those, those things in your life that distract you from that out and concentrate on Him. But you know what? As we grow a little bit older and grow a little bit more in this way, we take a lot of this stuff for granted. We need to get back to that time when we realize that Jesus Christ is coming. There's a psalm uh, that was believed to be written by David, David, for celebration, but much of it is quoted in the Gospels about uh, account of uh, Paul Sunday. And that's Psalm uh, 118, 22 to 29. It says, The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done this this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. For the Lord is God, and he has made his light to shine upon us with bows in hand, joining the festival, the festive procession up to the house, to the horns of the altar, you are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his love endures forever. You know, I know with this pandemic going on this past year, people get discouraged. I know since I've worked from home so much, uh, I, I go in and out now. Um, but for a long time, I was working like 99% from home. I don't want to leave the house. And it's not because I'm afraid of a pandemic. It's just I've gotten so used to being home that it's like, you know, those people that have that, that thing where they just can't leave the house. That's what I feel like when I leave some days. Even come to church this morning, I'm thinking to myself, well, did we let both dogs in? Did I shut the garage door? What's going on? And I checked all this stuff in my head and my mind, and, and Carol checked before we left. But I still think, Phew. We just need to realize that when we start feeling down like that, we can go to the Psalms. Because David has some great, fantastic encouragement for us. The cool thing about the Psalms, the cool thing about David, is he shows the bad side of our lives, too. He talks about when he failed. He talks about when he did, did bad things. But man, I love when he says, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. When I uh, do sermons, I look out all kinds of different things. I pray, search the word. I look at what some other people have had to say about, about the subject sometimes, too. And I found this on the internet. I don't remember where I found it exactly, so I can't give that credit to that person or whoever. But it's five things about Palm Sunday. I think they're really cool. Number one, God's word tells us the people cut palm branches and waved them in the air, laid them out on the ground before Jesus as he rode into the city. The palm branch represented goodness and victory, is symbolic 
of the final victory he would soon fulfill over death. You know, the people who were throwing these palm branches down didn't realize that Christ was going to be crucified. At this point, they were like, oh, wow, he's here. This is the king. This is the Messiah. Hosanna. But five days later, he's going to be crucified. And where were all these people at? Their German backs on. But you know what? That's a great prophecy of these palm branches because they knew the final, because they didn't know, but there's a final victory coming the day that Christ arrives. Second thing is Jesus chose to ride in on a donkey, which, which directly fulfilled the Old Testament prophecy in Zechariah, which I read. In biblical times, it was common for kings and uh, important people to ride by procession, riding the donkey. The donkey symbolized peace. So those who chose to write them showed that they were they came with peaceful intentions. Jesus even reminded us that he is the Prince of Peace. Third thing is when the people shout Hosanna, they were hailing Christ as King. That word actually means save us, save now. And though in their own minds they wanted, they waited for an earthly king. God had a different way in mind to bring the true salvation to all who would trust in him. Yes, amen. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Psalm 18 and 26 says again. It's kind of what I centered on today in my in my messages. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I think it's just a, a fantastic concept. Man, that day when he when he raptures his church, we're going to say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. <laughs> Four things the Bible said that Jesus wept for Jerusalem in the midst of the praise of the moment. He knew in his heart that it wouldn't be long that the same people would turn their backs on him, betray him, crucify him. His heart broke with the reality of how much they needed a Savior. And last, it says, Palm Sunday reminds us that the reign of Christ is far greater than any mind that man could ever conceive or plan. Man looked for someone to fight their battles in the present day world, yet God had the ultimate plan of sending his son to fight the final battle over death. This is the greatness of why we celebrate this week, because of Christ's ultimate sacrifice. We can be free of death. Amen? I think so often we put so much on that cross. And that's a good thing because we need to realize that Christ died. But you know what? The true victory was not him dying on the cross. The true victory is coming next Sunday when we celebrate his resurrection. When I was a very young Christian, I heard a, a person in church teaching Sunday school class, and he mentioned that he thought the Christians should, instead of having a cross, as the symbol of Christ, that we should have an open tomb. I think that's cool, an open tomb. On Sunday, the crowd cries Hosanna, and by the end of the week, Jesus is betrayed by the crowd, cries crucified. The disciples all leave him, but don't give up hope, because, as they say, Sunday's on its way. We did a, a Good Friday service here oh, quite a few years ago now. And it was so cool because we had the sanctuary cold. We were burning incense. It was kind of like a dark, damp feeling in here. And it was a Friday night. And we never did anything else except leave it that way. You know, we had monologues and songs and everything, and we left it that way. And we had the windows all covered up, so it was dark in here too. But then on Sunday morning, we walked into church on Easter Sunday. Wow. Night and day. Night and day. That's what Christ is. Night and day. He's the daylight. He's the peace. When everything else around us is going crazy, Christ is the peace. He is the one that can fulfill our lives. And I know in the sanctuary I preach you to people that are Christian people that I know of. I think I know most of you guys are. But we have some newer Christians too. We have to realize that Christ is our peace. 
Lean on him. He's our peace. We must remember that he came to meet our needs. He did not come to smite our enemies and lift us high. He came to serve and give his life for our sin that we would have everlasting life. John 3, 16. Everybody probably knows this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It's become such a cliche. You know, most people, even if they're not Christians, could, could quote that scripture, maybe not word for word. But you need to get back in that scripture and realize God so loved this world, he gave his son. He so loved this world, he gave his son on the cross for our sins. As we go through this next week, think about this triumphant ride on the, on the awesome day of Jesus. Thinking about the triumphant ride to the awesome day of Jesus' resurrection, let us also realize that throughout this week, all the thoughts and agony Jesus went through to get to that cross. Because in the end, the real heart of you and the Lamb is not our political problems, our social problems, our relationship problems. In the end, our dilemma is sin sickness. We need to remember as we go through this week that we're going to see today, which is an awesome day. Friday comes, he gets crucified. But folks, Sunday's on its way. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He is just such an awesome God. Would you stand with me? Father, I poured my heart out, Lord, this morning, Lord. I pray that God you just reach out your hand. I pray that something I've said to someone that despite the things that we had, the technical difficulties we had, that it would have, has touched somebody's heart, somebody's soul. If you don't know Jesus Christ this morning, he's there waiting at the door for you. He's there waiting for you to let him in. All it takes is that prayer. That, Father, I'm a sinner, but I believe Jesus Christ came to save my sins. I acknowledge him as Savior. Praise the Lord. I know we had some prayer requests. Uh, we had Sister Ethel's sister that needs our prayers. Anybody else? Carol, are you watching? Anybody else got it? Watching? You watching? I'm coming up here to give a praise report and a prayer request. Okay. And your sermon this morning is just fantastic. It goes right along with what I'm fixing to say. Uh, my sister Sandy called me yesterday, and she is so upbeat. She has got the peace of the Lord. What? Oh, she has got the peace of the Lord. She wanted me to know, and all of us, that she is not on her deathbed. That diagnosis from the doctor sounds terrible when they say stage four lung cancer. That just sounds devastating. But she's not at all devastated. She's depending upon the Lord. She says he brought her through it six years ago, and he will bring her through it now. She says she feels really good. She starts her uh, 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 radiation Monday. She's gonna have eight to 10 treatments. And then they'll decide what they're gonna do about the spot on her lung. But, but she's got the peace of the Lord. And she wanted us all to know, don't be sorry for her. Don't think she's, don't count her out because she'll be in church someday. And, uh, but still remember them. They still, they still going to need prayer. You know, everybody that's dealt with cancer knows you have ups and then you have the downs. But, but I just want everybody to know that she's fighting it and uh, she's going to make it. She's going to make it through. Praise the Lord. And that was what I want to say. Praise Did the Lord. Did you have just for Sandy. Just for Sandy and Bob. For Sandy and Bob, yeah. Because, you know, they still need prayer. They still need Anytime you have a loved one that's going through any kind of a, any kind of surgery, any kind of medical thing, you know, it's hard on the spouse. It really is. 
You know, when I'm, and I, I don't mean to take away or say anything, but when Billy had his heart surgeries, he slept through it. Carol and I are the ones that are sitting there crying and praying and saying, you know, God touch them, you know? And it's the same, same thing with anybody that's supporting somebody that's, that's got sickness in their life. This is hard on both. So Bob needs our prayers too as well, Sandy. And this is Wanda, you want us to pray for? Wanda, yes. Any other prayer requests today, Carol? Anybody seen anything? Besides uh, for me to get my camera straight? <laughs> Let's dismiss you for a minute. Father, we thank you like, once again, Lord, for the privilege of being here. I pray that God, you keep your hand upon Sandy, Lord. We, we talk about miracles today, Lord. And God, I know there's a miracle there, Lord. I pray that God, you touch her again, Lord, as you've done in the past. Father, I know that you, you're a miracle-working God because there's so many people around here that have been touched by cancer one way or another, Lord. And God, you've touched and you've healed, Lord. I pray that God, you, you do it again, Lord. I pray that God, you keep Bob uplifted. I pray that God should keep their spirits strong, their spirits mighty, man. And give them peace, Lord. I pray, God, for water, that you reach out your hand and touch her this morning. That God, where she is right now, I pray, God, for anybody else, Lord, that could be watching, Lord, that has a prayer request, I pray that God touch their heart, touch their life, Lord, meet that need, Lord. And I pray also, Lord, for the most part, that, that God, that anybody that's not a Christian, Lord, that God, they'll see this message, Lord, and give our hearts and our lives to you, Lord, because you are the one that gives us peace and passes all understanding. Blessed is he who comes in your name, Lord. Yes. Pray it all in Jesus' name this morning. Amen. Go home.